can I go 0.1 mile an hour faster here? Can I go 0.2? And I play that game with myself on those spaces in between. I'll be like, I'll grab a gear and go, okay, I'm going, you know, 12 miles an hour. Can I go Leadville, the podcast for the 100-mile mountain bike race. It is the show that breaks down, builds up, gets you ready, and, of course, freaks you out for the highest and arguably the hardest one-day mountain bike race in the country. This is the second-to-last show you will hear before you race the LT100, the second-to-last show before the countdown at 6th and Harrison. Let that sink in for just a second. And while you let it sink in, I will remind you that I'm Michael Houghton, a.k.a. Hottie, six-time attendee, five-time starter, four-time finisher of the LT100. Fatty, I actually have been to Leadville seven times. The first time through, I had hardly heard of the LT100. Mrs. Hottie and I were just passing through on our way from Vail to Aspen when we decided to stop for coffee in this cool little town. Huh. I didn't even know that it was possible to just pass through Leadville, it, it, that it's on the way to anywhere. But I can't make that claim, uh, even though I grew up at altitude. I don't think uh, too many people know this. I grew up in Alamosa, Colorado, which is at 8,000 feet and not too far from Leadville. But I never visited until the first time I raced the Leadville 100. Now, of course, I know better. And I'm wondering, by the way, did you go to City on the Hill Coffee that time you visited in Leadville? That is a good coffee shop. Good breakfast burritos, too. Yeah, we did go to City on the Hill. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, that's why we stopped, because anytime I see coffee, I stop. (laughs) I go, it's coffee time. That's a good policy. Yeah. So I stopped. I said, I need a cup of coffee if we're going to get to to Aspen Uh, with me driving. I'll need coffee. And I believe at the time that year, there was a bike shop next to City on the Hill. I don't know if it was Cycles for Life, if because they're now down the street. Or they've, or maybe they've always been down the street, but there was a bike shop like maybe two doors down from City on the Hill Coffee. And I went in there and I talked with those guys, and they yeah. told me a little bit about Leadville, about the town, not necessarily about the race. So that was kind of my little uh, introduction, yeah, to uh, Leadville. I think that the bike shop you're referencing, and I'm blanking on the name right now. I blank on everything when I need to know the name, but there was a bike shop there. It was pretty well known. And the owner actually relocated and opened up a shop in Moab. So went from one iconic cycling town to another iconic cycling town. And is doing the same thing, just in a little bit warmer and for sure redder, rockier climate. Um, Yeah, so uh, still, yeah, that for sure was where you visited. Yeah, well, folks, you're going to hear a lot about the town of Leadville Mm -hmm. in this show. We've got uh, lots of activities for you to check out in addition (laughs) to getting ready getting you a race ready. Of course, you're also hearing from Eldon Fatty Nelson, who's on an even more accelerated schedule than the rest of the LT100 field. Your 22nd Leadville start will be preceded by six days of racing in Breckenridge. So 21 Leadvilles. And now how many Breck epics, Fatty? Well, assuming that I finish, and you know, nothing is for sure. So uh, you know, I'm knocking on this IKEA simulation of wood. But this will be number two for us. Uh, the first time was in 2012. And it's that Breckenridge start, or that Breck Epic, I should say, started the day after Leadville 100 instead of the week before. But in either case, it's seven days of racing bookended by, you know, the Leadville 100. Uh, so anyway, the, by the time this next episode comes out, I should say, I'm going to be getting ready for the third of seven straight days of racing in high altitude Colorado mountains. I am getting ready, you know, starting to pack, finishing my checklists for a mountain biker's dream vacation. Uh, And might be other people's nightmare. So we'll see how that works (laughs) out for you. Uh, We want to remind everyone that the Leadville Trail 100 podcast is powered by Shimano and it's race ready XT DI2 group and matching brakes. 
how do you know what I am doing as I prepare all these checklists and get everything ready and everything bought to get my bikes ready for the Breck Epic and the Leadville race? I, I hope you're doing what your mechanic wants you to do, and that is clean your bikes. <laughs> oh, I, I wouldn't go that far, but I do plan to at least charge the battery for the DI2 on my felt and on both my wife's and my Epic's. And we're going to be uh, putting new brake pads on front and rear and put on the Maxxis Aspens that both the guys from Envy and Trainer Road recommended. And honestly, that's about it. I will clean my bikes. I'm just kidding about that. There just isn't that much that needs tuning up with the Shimano components that I've got on. You know, Shimano is like owning a brand new six-cylinder Honda Accord. It's Honda reliable with just a little extra dash of design pizzazz. Seriously, XT is like a six-cylinder Honda Accord, and XTR is kind of like the Acura TL, and you know, basically same car but with nicer paint. <laughs> it's, yep, things are There's, things are nice. That's my point. We we love your analogies. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you can go to bike.shimano.com for more. We will also have a link in the show notes for this episode at Leadville One Hundred Podcast.com. <laughs> And now on to the course. Each week, we have been discussing a segment of the Leadville out and back format. We've been doing the course in order, and currently, we have reached the top of the ever-so-lovely Powerline Climb. We're now ready, ready, that is, for a much, much needed descent. From mile 83 until mile 88 and a half, we are going downhill. And then we have what I like to say is the worst paved climb ever. I love that climb. I really do. I oh. under, I understand why you and, you know, frankly, probably 90% of the field out there hates that climb. But for those of us who fit in this tiny little Venn diagram intersect of strong climbers and endurance junkies, it's a little slice of hell-flavored heaven. And, of course, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Let's rewind back to mile 83, where we've just crested the power line, and, of course, we're weeping with relief and joy and probably cramps in our hamstrings. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, at that top section, you are very briefly on easy double track, just sort of maybe barely rolling downhill just long enough to catch your breath, take a quick drink and eat something, eat something, eat something, eat something, because you are going to be climbing again amazingly soon. You don't, <laughs> it, it seems like you have just downhill forever but it doesn't last long. What you do now is going to be the difference between a good turquoise lake road climb and what Hottie has, a miserable one. Uh, the Sugarloaf Descent is a section of the course I, I really do like, as I mm -hmm. like the, the climb. You remember this going outbound. This is the part of the trail that a lot of us think is the best part of the day, especially in the morning when it's so kind of wet out, yep. and the sun is coming up, so it's absolutely beautiful. It's a little different by afternoon time, certainly. It's drier, it's going to be hotter. Uh, and now it's downhill, and on a normal day when you're fresh, you'd be guaranteed to have fun in this section of the course. It's pretty, there are fun lines to find. It's certainly rough in certain sections, but nothing a mountain bike can't manage. When you're 84 miles into this race, though, it is not just pretty tough. It's tough. This is hard. It's going to be really hard mm -hmm. on your body. Expect a workout on those triceps and forearms especially. I mean, if your hands and forearms and triceps aren't a little achy already, they will be by the time you get to the bottom of this baby. Stay focused because this is an easy place to get a flat or have a crash. And with everything you've done to get this far, you definitely do not want to end your day with a crash or a smash or your face into some rocks on the Sugarloaf <laughs> Descent. Fatty, this is one of those spots, though, where it does bring up the Leadville dilemma. Hardtail versus squishy. Oh, that is the that is the question that is at the forefront of my thoughts constantly right now. I've been going through a huge struggle trying to decide this question. I've been hitting some PRs with my climbs lately, and earlier this week I actually KOM'd a local trail which does not happen that often. Uh, and all of these PRs and the KOM were always on my hardtail, on my felt doctrine. And as you know, I've been 
uh, I'm a standing climber. I have been for years. It's kind of burned into my brain from a lot of years of single speeding. However, for this particular section, coming down Sugarloaf, the argument for the full suspension epic is pretty darn strong. It is definitely the difference between surviving and thriving on this segment. And unlike, you know, and especially since you can kind of plow through and over a lot of these embedded rocks, it just makes it, it's going to make it nice. So in my head, you know, in, unless something goes wrong with the epic during the Breck uh, race, I'm going to be on the full suspension bike. Uh, for this section, as well as just, you know, because I expect to have with six days of riding in my body, I'm going to be appreciating any kind of comfort that I can get. But back to this race, you can use the whole trail, uh, unlike when you're coming down Columbine, and finding the line is half the fun. Yeah, the two-way traffic is gone at this point, yep. so the trail is all yours. And whether you're riding full suspension or a hardtail with just the front fork, uh, this is a, a sugar loaf will point out the reason why you need to pay close attention to sag and air pressure. So fork mm-hmm. sag and suspension sag and making sure that's set up properly. I know that most of Leadville just seems like you could roll over it on a rigid bike and you can, but sugar loaf is one of those spots that suspension really will help you go much faster and setting up your suspension. It's no good to have suspension unless it's set up properly. So do yourself a favor while you're in Leadville that week of getting ready, or if you're traveling up in the days before, just recheck that sag and that fork and shock. If you have a shock air pressure, and make sure it is it is just it's dialed just perfectly for you. Now the Sugarloaf descent, fatty, is an interesting mental switch, or it mm-hmm. has been for me. You know, because you go from a mind-numbing climb, climb that is, uh, uh, on power line, to a spot where speed and focus on your line really becomes an issue. So you've got to throw the switch because you can be kind of a little dead brained as you're coming off that power line climb. And suddenly you're looking for lines, watching for rocks, dealing with switchbacks. Yeah. The light has certainly changed on you. So there's a lot of different things you have to key on as you're coming on your senses. You want to make sure your senses really come alive as you hit the power line or rather the sugar loaf descent. Initially, it's it's fine because you kind of roll as you come off power line. But before you know it, you're going to be into some switchbacks. They're not hard switchbacks. They're more gradual, but they can get be loose, especially if it's been dry in Leadville mm-hmm. and in the surrounding mountains. Um, any moisture you may have seen there again from the morning, probably going to be gone. The good news is, again, you won't have any two-way traffic. You might be catching people or people might be catching you. You have to watch for people in front of you and behind you as you're moving past. But there won't be people coming the opposite way, which is great. Um, After those uh, turns, you're just going to have a straightaway from that. That straightaway, though, in fact, that straightaway, you can almost see the bottom of the climb. Once you hit it, Hagerman will be off to your right, and you can nearly see the bottom of it. There's a lot of trees, and the trees kind of prevent full vision, full peripheral vision of what's going on. But you'll be able to see almost the bottom. To deal with that descent, though, that last section there, it is very rocky, and here's a spot where, again, you could blow a tire pretty easy, wreck, something bad could happen. So sure. focus really on that bottom part of, of Sugarloaf. Yeah, keep your eyes uh, forward and pay attention. And as you say, uh, you're in that straightaway, and toward the very end of that, you're going to be able to see far enough ahead that you'll be able to see the course marshal. And that course marshal is going to be waving at you and indicating a hairpin of a right turn. This means that you are at mile 85 and on Hagerman's Pass. By the way, Hadi, you notice I just said Hagerman instead of Hagerman, which is what I've mm-hmm. been see- saying this entire podcast. Uh, that is because I bothered to text Cole Clover, the son of Ken Clover, today. And he grew up in Leadville, and he said that you, Hadi, have been pronouncing it correctly, that the locals mm-hmm. call it Hagerman, even though I maintain it is spelled Hagerman. Anyway, Mm. it means that I have to rewire my brain after pronouncing it Hagerman for more than 20 years. So uh, if we had bet, I'd uh, owe you a 20 right now. That's okay. Uh, (laughs) You can pay me in some other way. Uh, Hagerman, yes. Hagerman uh, is a a relief site. Obviously, suddenly now you're onto a much wider road. You can turn off all that focus I told you about picking a right line because... 
It is wide. It's washboardy, but it's oh, yeah. wide. But uh, the only thing about Hagerman is now that you're on Hagerman, <laughs> gravity will be less of a help. You'll probably be pedaling at this point as you head down towards the pavement. Yep, pedaling and on a real washboardy road. Uh, and it's definitely a, I mean, we keep mentioning pedaling. It is a serious working downhill, very chattery. It seems like as wide and as gentle of a slope as it is. Uh, that you ought to be able to take a moment to eat. And I generally don't eat when I am on ha- going down Hagerman's. It's just I'm going fast and the road is so washboardy. You try to get a gel up to your face and wind up putting it in your nose. It's just no fun. Uh, if you've got a Camelback, it's a good segment to drink. Otherwise, maybe hang tight for just a couple miles because you're going to have a much better opportunity to eat and drink very, very soon. So we're at mile 86.8, meaning you've done, uh, you've been on this wide dirt downhill, Hagerman, for just under two miles. And Mm -hmm. you're going to see another course marshal waving you to make a left. Yeah, and it's a very serious left. As soon as you you see this marshal, start scrubbing your speed because this is a hard, sharp downhill downhill hairpin your second hairpin in two miles and this time you are going to be going downhill onto pavement and i have personally witnessed the aftermath of someone bringing too much heat into this turn high siding it at the apex of that turn and ending his race with an ambulance ride uh you know just 17 miles from the finish line incredible shame so word to the wise take this corner safe then build your speed back up and once you have safely mm-hmm. made this turn onto Turquoise Lake Road, you have a fast downhill. And this is a spot where, unlike Hagerman, you can reach in the pocket and grab something to eat. It's about a mile and a half. You'll be actually not just fast, but I'd say screaming downhill. I mean, yes. you can get in a tuck. You can get one of those Tour de France tucks. What are they calling those tucks now where you sit on the, the top two? About the super crouch, I think I've heard it called. The, yeah, the super tuck. That's what it is. Uh, <laughs> look, I don't, I'm not endorsing that do thing. Do not but, do that. <laughs> Again, what you really want to do is not focus so much on your tuck here, but grabbing something out of your pocket, drinking, eating, because this is a good spot to do it. You can definitely ride with one hand here if you need to, uh, if you need to do it that way. Uh, Watch the road surface, though. Uh, Mm -hmm. There are potholes. I mean, again, if you can uh, eat and kind of keep an eye on the road, that's probably not a bad idea because there's some obstacles here to to be uh, mindful of um, while you're eating one-handed and trying to take in a jail. Uh, as you bottom out on the cement section, on this paved section, you have reached the May Queen campground. And then you have a sweeping right-hand turn. And then you go up to the climb <laughs> that I hate. Uh, I know you do. A lot of people do. And as I said at the beginning of uh, the course today, I love this climb. I really, I I look forward to this climb. When I went out to do the Silver Rush 50, the day after, uh, Lisa and I went and we did this climb. Uh, It's part of the Turquoise Lake Loop and is worth doing just on its own merit. But I actually really extended myself, set a PR on my road bike, uh, (laughs) which uh, turns out you can go a lot faster on a road bike when you haven't uh, got 85 miles of racing in you going up that hill. Uh, so it's a place where people like me, you know, people who love the long, hard climbs can make up ground uh, to the people that we've, you know, on the people that we've lost time to, like you, <laughs> on, as you were blowing by us on Sugarloaf. Mm-hmm. And there are a few things that can help any racer make the best of this road climb, whether you like it, like me, or not, like Hadi. First, know the distance. It's 2.7 miles, but just tell yourself it's three because it's hard to remember decimals. So three miles. It's three miles starting at that sweeping right, uh, right after the campground. Hadi just described it. And that includes one or two easy recovery spots. One very brief downhill, in fact, for a sec that you're going to make, you know, uh, some good time and improve your average. My point is, this is not pure grind. It's just three-ish miles, and you're climbing just about 700 feet. Feel It doesn't sound like that much when you're talking about it like this. But yeah, a lot of people really feel just demolished by the time they hit this, and this is a climb that gets into your head. What I like to do is remind myself that it's really no more than just three-quarters of one of the local climbs I do all the time, the Suncrest climb. 
Uh, it's, you know, which is four miles, 1,200 feet. I've done that a million times, and I understand it very well. And I recommend trying to find something like that for yourself, something that takes the mystique and seeming endlessness out of this cl- out of this climb, get it out of your head, map it to something at home that you're familiar with and have conquered many times. Just tell yourself, this is just that. This is just a sun, cl- sun crest climb in my case. Nothing more than that. Then at mile 91.4, you're going to turn left into Carter Aid Station. This is a little mini aid station filled with volunteers and, of course, mm-hmm. filled with food and drink. And you can refill your bottles if you don't have enough for the uh, last 12 miles in and two climbs ahead of you before you roll up that red carpet. So, yeah, it's a great place to stop. I love the people there. Carter Aid folks, oh, yeah. they're, they're like angels in the trees. They are, and you know, they are cheering you on, and they know that you have, you know, that you are so close to having done something big. What's crazy though is what you just said there, Hottie. You've got twelve miles left in this hundred and three and a half mile race, and you've still got two climbs ahead of you. <laughs> so we will talk about those as well as all of the downhill that is ahead of you in the next special finish line episode of the course. Fatty, one other note on Sugarloaf. You know, uh, it's a good time to talk about our sponsor in Sugarloaf because mm-hmm. Envy, Envy has made an adjustment to their M525 wheels that I think you are going to really feel on that Sugarloaf descent. While everyone has been trying to make wheels stiffer, Envy took a look at what they had and decided to go with more compliance so it's cross-country wheels can better deal with a rocky descent like Sugarloaf. Yeah, they're a little more forgiving, a little wider, a lot stronger, and really just dialed for any kind of riding that people like us are going to do. I have really been enjoying these. And in the Silver Rush 50, which is about 50 miles of what you get in the uh, two miles of Sugarloaf, they were just remarkable. I, of course, had some trouble with knobs ripping off of my tires. This was a very rocky course. Um, And, you know, I I have things that we could talk about as far as the Conti X King protection tires. But um, I did not have a single second's worth of trouble with the wheels. They felt great. And of course, you can learn more about all of Envy's wheels and components, many of which seem like they're made with a Leadville 100 in mm-hmm. mind, but can handle pretty much anything you throw at them, any terrain, including Sugarloaf. Just go to Envy, that's E-N-V-E dot com. It is your women's champion, Rebecca Rush, from Ketchum, Idaho. Welcome back, Rebecca. Okay, Fatty, the four-time Leadville Trail 100 champ, Rebecca Rush, is standing by. It is time for questions for the Queen. Reba, welcome. Excited to ask you one particular question for the Queen today. Okay, I'm ready. (laughs) What is it? So, a couple of years ago, uh, just as backstory, um, you volunteered to work with Lisa um, the week before as well as on race day to help her achieve a dream, which was finishing under nine hours. And just for people who haven't heard before, Lisa is my wife. And so, of course, you know, I'm speaking from a perfectly 100% non-biased point of view, right? Um, And to this day, her brightest, I guess, most strong memory of the entire day is you slapping your leg or slapping your butt and yelling at her from behind or from ahead sometimes, pedal, 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 pedal. (laughs) And of course, the the end of this story is that she finished in eight hours and 38 minutes. So, I mean, didn't just squeak under that nine-hour mark, but finished it with more than 20 minutes to spare. She smashed it. (laughs) Yeah, but the thing is, you you volunteered to help her with this after it was really too late for her to make any gains in fitness. It was just a week or two before the – or two, maybe two or three weeks mm-hmm. before the race itself. So her fitness what it was what it was. And yet she finished, I think, 45 minutes faster than before. That pedal, 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 pedal. What was that about? <laughs> oh, that, <laughs> that was made a difference. Yeah, well, it was really awesome. Like you said, there wasn't time for Lisa to change her fitness, and she always goes into Leadville really fit. And so I looked at the mm-hmm. places, and I, I kind of interviewed her. 
and like, okay, what do you do here? What do you do in aid stations? How do you do this climb? What do you do there? And I, I looked for places, um, where, where we could make up time, but given the tools that she was coming into the, into the race with. And, you know, this, me encouraging her to always keep pedal, 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 um, is, uh, this is what I call working on the spaces in between. And I've talked a lot about this, but, and I use this strategy in every race, um, because I feel like there's always people fitter than me. There's always people who are better climbers or descenders. And so what I try to look at are the spaces in between going hard when other people are going easy and then going easy when other people are going hard. And in Leadville, particularly, everyone focuses on the climbs and they're, they're just got it in their brain, Columbine, Powerline, St. Kevin's. And mm-hmm. I really feel like all that time that we made up with Lisa were the spaces in between. So all those flats and all those rollers just over the hill where people get over this giant hill and then they sit up, they stop pedaling and they just kind of check out of the race. And I was really encouraging Lisa that, we'd have no coasting other than really descending and going downhill. But the rest of the time we're going to be moving our legs, even if it wasn't super fast or super hard, she was going to pedal all of the flats, all of the sort of false downhills and, and gain magic minutes there by just pedaling and not coasting. And Mm -hmm. I think that that is, um, you know, for everyone listening, if you can have the discipline to do that, when everyone sits up and pedals or sits up and stops pedaling and coasts, um, keep the legs spinning around and, and just pedal, pedal, pedal. <laughs> it's yeah. really that simple. There was a reason why, I, you know, I've been, I've been wanting to ask this question for, you know, many episodes of this podcast. And we're waited, I waited until just a couple of weeks before the big race. We're down to, I think, about 10 days before the race. If people mm-hmm. listen to this the day it's released, it's too late for you to become any more fit. Right. However, it is not too late to make a big difference in your race. This is the time when your mental strategy really comes into play, where if, uh, you know, the time you get going up Columbine is going to be the time you get. The time you get going up the power line is the time that you're going to get. You can't get any faster than you're going to be. Mm -hmm. But the time that you get as you are cruising uh, from pipeline to the Twin Lakes Dam, that mm-hmm. can change because there are lots of little easy downhills where it's easy to coast. There are lots of false flats where it is easy to soft pedal because it feels a little bit difficult. But if you put in the effort there, it can make the difference between a 910 or a 915, which was where Lisa was, and an 840 or an 839 which is where Lisa wound up when she really started to get those spaces in between and be efficient. 45 minutes by just like honing, smoothing everything out, like you said, and working on, on the places that, um, the spaces in between 45 minutes is huge. <laughs> it is. It, it, last episode, we talked a little bit about, or, or a couple episodes ago, we talked about being fast through the aid stations. If you be efficient in the places where other people are resting, mm-hmm. then you can make up a huge amount of time in this race without being a second fitter. So. And something I, you know, when I'm in those sections, and I would encourage Lisa to pedal, 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 but you get out into those flats and it's grab a gear, grab a gear you know, just one more gear. And this is where, again, I really like to look at my average mile per hour or my speed. And I look at my speed and I'm like, can I go 0.1 mile an hour faster here? Can I go 0.2? And I play that game with myself on those spaces in between. I'll be like, I'll grab a gear and go, okay, I'm going, you know, 12 miles an hour. Can I go 12.2, 12.3, 12.4? You know, um, and that's the game that I play to keep myself engaged and not lose focus and not lose um, attention in those spaces because you won't maybe won't have me yelling in your ear, pedal, 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 like I was for Lisa. Um, Maybe some people will now after this episode, but you can really police yourself by looking at your speed and seeing if you can get 0.1 more. If you can bring your average speed up 0.1, you are doing awesome. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely (laughs) true, especially 70 miles into the race. If you can notch up your average speed a tenth of a mile per hour, 
then you are really getting after it. And well, and then it's of. no guesswork. You know if you're going to hit your goal by, you know, unless something weird happens, you know 50 miles, hey, I'm on target to hit my goal. You're not waiting until that last corner and looking at the clock going, oh, man, I'm not going to make it. Um, y- you have a heads up, and you have time to do something about it at mile 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. <laughs> yep, yep. You sure do. All right. Well, we talked once upon a time a few episodes back about having a mantra. I would suggest to our listeners that the mantra pedal, 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 pedal <laughs> is a pretty good one. It sure worked for Lisa. You can take, you can have it. That's fine. <laughs> Fantastic. Reba, always a pleasure talking with you. Thanks so much for answering some questions for the queen. Thanks, Fatty. Hottie, in this interview, I can't overemphasize uh, uh, the importance of one of the nuggets of wisdom from the Queen of Pain here. There are innumerable moments on this course when you can coast just for a second and it feels so nice to rest or you can pedal and gut it out. These few little moments, um, you know, or these innumerable lots of moments of resting or going hard add up to minutes over miles one way or the other. And that can add up to half an hour or more in a race like this. It's happened for Lisa. It's happened for me. And this kind of pedal or don't pedal for a moment doesn't have anything to do with your legs or lung. Uh, What it has to do with is brain and willpower and focus. For a lot of people, these moments in between, as Rebecca describes them, can be the difference between hitting or even beating your goal and missing it. Okay, let's end this segment with a quick plug for Rebecca's Private Idaho. It's a great race. Yeah. Now with a stage race component and a fun way to extend your season once you're, you finish the Leadville 100, check out Rebecca'sPrivateIdaho.com for more info. Hottie, Brandon Dykster House, my main point of contact at our sponsor, The Feed, has caught the Leadville bug. And it's kind of good to see you. There's sort it's of a, contagious, yes. a, a reversal of flow. Um, and he is racing the Leadville 100 race, sta- uh, Leadville 100 stage race this weekend, starting today when we're recording here on Friday. And it'll be done by the time our listeners hear this. He's pacing a friend and he's hoping to qualify into next year's Leadville 100. Yeah, as we record here on Friday, July 27th, Brandon's finished the first stage in two hours, 53 minutes, which is a good time, fast time, in fact, and would put him on the bubble for a sub nine if this were the whole 100 mile race. Fatty, you talked to Brandon about what he's eating for this race. What's he up to? Oh, yeah. Of course, I talked to him about food. He is with the feed and he's he's an elite level athlete. I'm guessing he was not going at 100% pacing his friend for this thing. And I did, of course, ask him about food, and he has a great plan, as you would expect. Uh, We were texting back and forth, and he said that he is drinking two bottles per hour. uh, And, you know, for the first hour, he is drinking a bottle of Scratch and then a bottle of Martin uh, 320. And then for the second hour, a bottle of water and a bottle of Morton. And then for the third hour, a bottle of water and a bottle of Morton again. And just doing that, you notice that there's nothing about any kind of gel or bar or waffle or anything. That's 300 calories an hour right there, which is right at the sweet spot of how many, uh, you know, how many calories a racing athlete ought to have. He's pacing and he's hoping that he wouldn't be at max effort, but he, you know, at that pace, you're not going to be too far off. And I thought that he, you know, just using straight up liquid, that was pretty interesting. I would be, that's something I might try someday. Of course, not quite right now because I've already got my plan in place. I asked him how he would switch that up if he were doing the Leadville 100 as, you know, the one day race, not the stage race. He said he'd go to Morton 160 in the bottle and supplement that with an assortment of chews like Honey Stinger, the uh, Scratch Chews, uh, which are really good, by the way. And uh, and and uh, the cliff blocks, and as well as the waffles. He likes the untapped and the honey stinger ones. I love the untapped ones, by the way. By the way, oh, I and I'm sort of tangenting here, but you've got to try the new coffee untapped uh, gel syrup. Uh, it, that is, if you like coffee, so and I know you it's do. Maple. Wait a second. Yeah, You're scratching me right where I at your maple syrup and coffee. 
Maple syrup infused with coffee. That's Hello. exactly right. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can tell that you're going to be making an order right, <laughs> oh, <boy>. right after this. <laughs> New addiction on the way. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan, and he is a big fan as well. And you know what? We have a new uh, fatty box available that does, in fact, have some of those untapped maple with the coffee as well as the regular untapped with uh, just the straight up uh, maple syrup. It is so delicious. You're going to like both of these. And all you got to do is use the Leadville 15 code and to get the 15% discount on this brand new box that we are doing. Wow. Some great products there. Yeah. Uh, some really good products, in fact. And our podcast listeners can get a great price on a brand new pack custom with some great products curated for Leadville racers. Go to thefeed.com forward slash Leadville for our new Leadville pack. Be mm -hmm. sure to use the code Leadville15 for a 15% discount on either of those boxes. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you can get uh, use that Leadville15 code anytime you're buying any amount of Morton. So whether you're getting our race box or something else, pick up some Morton as well and get that 15% discount. Really recommend it. A lot of us are really liking that. Again, thefeed.com forward slash Leadville and use the Leadville 15 code at checkout. Hottie, a lot of our listeners are going to be arriving in Leadville for the race very soon. Some of them may be listening to this podcast as they're traveling. And if they are taking our advice they are not going to be spending a lot of their time on bikes in the days leading up to this race. Of course not. But of course, a lot of them are coming up with friends and family, mm -hmm. and those people are going to get bored if all they do is sit around in their hotel or Airbnb watching their racer lie around with their legs raised. Yeah. I And personally, as a racer, no good at just lying around either. I simply can't. I would go nuts. I don't need to do anything that leaves me exhausted. But frankly, I can use some diversion to keep me from going completely insane with pre-race nerves. The fact is, there is a lot to do in Leadville, lots of fun stuff. Some of it's super obvious. You're going to stumble into it yourself, like all the shops on the main drag, and there are some hidden gems. Well, let's start with one of my favorite topics, and that is food. Uh, Mrs. Hardy and I were going over the places we have eaten in Leadville, and she was looking them up online, and when she searched for restaurants in Leadville to get a list... <laughs> The Shell gas station came up as a place to eat. Uh, nice. So look, folks, if you're looking for fine dining, just remember that the Shell gas station could show up as a place to eat in Leadville. I mean, Leadville is not Denver or San Francisco. It is Leadville. It is a mining town. It was a working class town. So you can find food there and you can find good food there. Mm -hmm. Just don't expect to um, have to put on a coat and tie no. to go out and eat anywhere. It's not... It's not that. And, you know, look, we eat in mostly, Fatty, when we're in Leadville. All our breakfasts, most of our lunches mm -hmm. are at whatever house we're staying in. And about twice a week, maybe a little more, we'll go out, uh, but never on race night. We always eat in on race night. I usually make a steak or something like that for, for a pre-race uh, dinner. Uh, we shop in Frisco, by the way, yeah. for our food. Uh, there's a Whole Foods in Frisco if you're coming up from Denver. Um, you can also shop in Golden, Colorado. If you land in Denver, rent a car, you can shop in Golden on your way up the hill or in Western Denver in, in, outside uh, the edge of the city too. There's some good, you know, good local place. If you're into organic stuff, you mm -hmm. need that kind of freshness. That's certainly there. You're not going to so much find it in Leadville. I think the little store there gets hammered, but that's, so we usually head to Frisco for a quick Whole Foods run. Yeah. That said, if you are looking for just a plain old grocery store, there is a Safeway right in town. And that's where I do all of my shopping because we ain't fancy folk like the Hottons are. Oh, come on. <laughs> but Safeway gets hammered though. It will it late does. in the week. You'll notice you better have your supplies oh, by yeah. Thursday because people roll into that town, but that poor Safeway gets a lot of pressure. Let's, oh, yeah. let's talk about the places you've been. What, what do you like? You can kick it off. We're, we're, Fatty and I are going to kind of take turns going over our individual lists, our, our places we love, the places we've been. What do you? Sure. What, what's top on your list there? Well, I, one place that I go every single day is to the city on a hill, 
coffee and espresso. I really like that place, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show. I uh, love getting a breakfast burrito there. I love getting myself a mocha, get an extra uh, extra shot or two or three uh, in there. And, you know, it's just I'm, I am all set for the day. I think most of the town goes to City on a Hill for their coffee in the morning. So go early or be prepared to wait in line. Yeah, and even if you don't drink coffee, go there because you're going to see other racers. It's a good place to yeah. catch up with folks. I have a favorite photo of mine with Dave Weens. Ran into him there. Uh, had to get a picture with him real quick. So it's just a good place to kind of see what the chatter is, where other folks are riding, what they've seen on some of the climbs, on some of the recon rides. So City on a Hill, Coffee and Espresso. It's the first place I ever went to in Leadville, Colorado, long before I had plans to race the Leadville Trail 100. Tennessee Pass, Ca- uh, Pass Cafe, Fatty is a favorite of everyone who shows up in Leadville. I went there. It was one of the first places I I ate in Leadville as a racer. I know you've been there a bunch of times too. Yeah, I'm not a super inventive eater. Uh, I always go there and get a buffalo burger uh, either the day before or the day on the evening after I do the race just because I love getting a lot of red meat. Uh, Just uh, the... You know, especially after the race, the craving is almost unbearable, and that hits the spot. It is a good burger. It is a big burger, and when you are hungry, it is a not bad choice. There are, of course, lots and lots of other options, and you'll be able to find something you like there, but um, good spot to go uh, to get yourself uh, your uh, pre-race protein. We'll say Mm -hmm. that. Tennessee Pass Cafe is right on Harrison there on the south end of town. Yep. Uh, you can't miss it. Again, late in the week, that place is going to get really busy. So yeah. uh, be prepared to wait if it's Thursday night or something like that. And I would say a Friday night, the night before the race, you probably want to skip it all together. It's probably going to be way too busy. Yeah, tr- I, Fatty, uh, I don't know for the life of me, for the many times I went to Leadville, I never put pizza and Leadville together. I knew really? about this place. I'd seen it there, but I went, oh, pizza and Leadville? I mean, how do they get things to leaven up here? Does the yeast really work? I never really believed it. And then finally, last summer, I went to High Mountain Pies and went, well, what have I been doing? I've been missing the probably the best place in Leadville. And they have really fatty, they have really good pizza in Leadville. They do. They have fantastic pizza. I love their crust. I mean, I'm a guy who usually leaves the outer edge of the crust, you know, just like, man, I don't need that. That's dry and, and no good. But at High Mountain Pies, I eat it all. That is a good place. They're pretty fast. They manage the throughput of a lot of racers surprisingly well. Tip to the wise. Call your order in and let them tell you when you can go and pick it up. And then, you you know, you can eat it on one of the picnic benches outside or take it back to your place. But definitely call your order in early or be prepared to wait on race day. I mean, basically, for everywhere you go to in Leadville, bear in mind that Leadville is a tiny little town and is not used to the throughput of a giant race like the Leadville 100. And so, you know, they just, you know, they don't have that kind of of a food bandwidth and so you got to be ready to wait be patient be cool about this it is a small town and you just love the vibe don't worry so much about time mm-hmm. actually mrs honey and i walked in and did our order we didn't mind standing around there and hanging right. out it was cool you know again it's another one of these places where they treat you great they mm-hmm. really they genuinely want to know how you are they thank you it's really a, a great place now i know i made a joke fatty to start off this feature about <laughs> not needing reservations in town and the shell gas station coming up as a place to eat but there is one place actually that we actually we made reservations last summer to, to eat there it's a new place it's called treeline kitchen huh. this is a place where you can get a, you know up what i would call a proper sit-down meal where there's waiters and tablecloths and a menu and a wine list it's treeline kitchen it is new uh, they're doing, you know, that, that whole fork, what is it? Farm to fork, farm to table idea. So lots of organic yeah. product. Uh, I took my picky eater, Sean in there. He had a great meal, um, uh, local fish, uh, obviously Colorado beef on the menu. Just a really nice place. We wanted a reward. We have a, a dear friend up there, Jeff Roberts, who helps us out in the feed zone all the time. So we made a reservation, brought him down for a nice meal. I, it's a great place. If you have a reason to be out for a nice meal that night, I would say Treeline Kitchen is a, a place to check out. You know, I haven't been there, but we will have to try it this upcoming trip. Mm-hmm. And a place where you for sure do not need a reservation is Periodic Brewery. Uh, that is a well-known place. PB stands for, of course, the periodic symbol for Leadville. 
Periodic Brewery, also PB. Very clever. Make sure you ask for Mel, who is my stepdaughter and who works there. Uh, also, uh, you, a little tip for the people who are maybe wanting to post to Instagram or uh, or their other social media needs. Uh, Periodic Brewery is well known for having the best internet in town for some reason. And it is huh. directly adjacent to Floyd's of Leadville, uh, where you can get your CBD or other uh, pharmaceutical fixes. <laughs> take, mm. take care of whatever you got to need. Who knows? You might run into Floyd. And if you do, say hi to the guy. He is a super nice guy. Uh, we've had Jonathan Lee on how many times on this show talking about how to get yourself fit? We're about to set them back. Here, go get some CBDs and drink five beers the week of the <laughs> It's a good idea, huh? No, actually, periodic brewing, I love them. Look, yeah, uh, uh, mountain biking and beer drinking just kind of go hand in hand. You got to go in, have yourself a cold one or a couple. Um, take it's it true. easy. Obviously, you got a race coming up. You know, that stuff can end up in your legs too, but it's cool. It's a great place. Very again, a great chill atmosphere, a good place to hang out. Of course, what goes great? with crafted beer mexican food i mean every mountain biker loves mexican food at least i think every at least i think so there's actually two <laughs> uh mexican places that at least i know of that i've been to in town one is the leadville grill bar and cafe it is again on the south end of town and on the uh the valley side of leadville it's a little tar- hard to find um, I would call it more, um, ca- almost not cafeteria style would be bad, but big tables there. You can mm-hmm. really put a big crowd around a table there. It's the a family style. The, yeah. yeah. The Mexican food is not refined. It's mashed beans and rice type of thing. You know, you're going to get your typical, you know, t- you'll get a tamale there if you want, big burrito, stuff like that. Uh, I wouldn't expect to be blown away there, but they're going to feed you and it's not going to be expensive at all. And again, if you have a big crowd, that's a good place to go. A smaller place. That's uh, on the other side of on the other side of Harrison, up on Second, I think it is. It's Casablanca. It's a small and it's a white house. It's a small <laughs> white house, Casablanca. Makes a, sense. a smaller menu, a little more refined food, um, but uh, don't expect any vegetarian options in there. You probably you'll have to special order it. If you're a vegetarian, you go into Casablanca. You're gonna have to ask them to pull meat out of everything. But we've always had good service at both places, especially Casablanca. We've been there a couple of times. It's uh, they're both great places, and uh, I would say if you're up for a little Mexican, you can find it in town there in Leadville. You know, in 20 years, I have never ordered Mexican while in Leadville. I am just a little bit too nervous about that. You know, the day after the race, I bet Mexican would sound good to me. Hmm. So it always sounds good to me. So. Oh, it I'm always sounds oh. good. I'm just you know, I'm just so nervous about my stomach, and you know, <laughs> it, it, it just you know, beans and race and nerves and yeah it's just not going not going to happen for me but you know everyone knows their own gi system right Right, so let's let's move on from food uh i want because it's we said you know not a lot of food options and then we gave people a lot of food options but there's fun stuff to do besides eat as well there is for one thing the geology museum the national mining hall of fame and museum i think it is called and mm-hmm. it is a cool spot you uh seeing uh the mining history of leadville is definitely worth your time um i come from you know there's a little bit of mining in my blood my grandfather hmm. was a miner in butte montana he mined for copper up there um, so I was really interested in this place. It is, you know, I will say this, it's Leadville focused as it should be. I mean, it's of there course. in Leadville, although it is a national hall of fame for mining. So you're going to see, I mean, if you're into geology and rocks and how do people pull ore out of, you know, caves and dynamite and all, it's all represented there. You're going to find it all neat. You know, the le- they have a fine collection of the headlamps that miners wear and so it's very neat. And then the hall of fame itself is just uh, mostly a lot of plaques. You walk around, you read names, read their history a little bit, but Interesting thing. I mean, it's a it's a great place for it. I mean, Leadville is steeped in in a history of mining. That town wouldn't be there without you know silver in those hills. And so, it's a cool place uh, to check out. Yeah. What else do we have? Um, you know, how about it, riding? How about what do you want to do next? Single track riding or gondola riding? I'm going to go back to mines for just a second. One thing that you absolutely must do. You know, I, I, I really I should have put this one at the top of the list. Go do the baby doe mine tour. Uh, and make sure you do the guided tour version of it. Doesn't cost very much. A guy who knows a lot about it will take you not deep into the mines, but into the actual mines, and then a sit down to hear the story of Baby Doe, which is a tragic story, beautifully told in person, 
and in the place where uh, baby, Do- you know, the famous baby doe uh, lived and died on her own, and it is it is definitely worth your time. Uh, so absolutely, make sure you do and go, you know, do go check that out. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else do we have in town? We have uh, the train rides in town, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I always go do the train ride uh, because that is a fantastic way to, first of all, see something kind of nice and get some beautiful views of the mountainside. And since it is just an out and back, the train track only goes a certain distance and then just comes back on the same track to the beginning. I always find myself sleeping on the way back, you know, just the gentle rocking and the ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk of the train. You know, you just, you know, I conk out. It's <laughs> So if you're looking to catch a, a few extra Z's, this may not be a bad way to do it. Um, then there are fun things to do uh, outside of Leadville as well. You uh, have, uh, you, always, you go to a gondola, don't you? Well, I, I did this once. Um, yeah. You know, I Leadville... As the week builds towards the race, a lot more people are going to start show up, uh, coming to town. The banners start going up. Um, sure. The grandstands go up. Your pressure might start going up, too. It gets busy, yeah. And it's not a bad idea to get out of Leadville for a day. And especially, I have Mrs. Hottie with me, and I feel like, let's. I'd like to take her out to a couple places. So, one year, we uh, last year, in fact, last summer, we went down to Breckenridge. Breckenridge is, mm-hmm. what, it's about an hour, less than an hour to Frisco, and then Breckenridge is another about... 20 minutes in from from Frisco. Yeah. Go down to Breckenridge. Great town. Ski resort town. Lots of shops. Uh, easy walking area. But one thing that we did uh, that was a real surprise for me is right there in the parking lot, there's a gondola that will take you up to the mountain, up to the ski mountain. Mm. And provided you don't have a bicycle, it's free. I mean, you're in Breckenridge, one of the best, nicest resort ski resorts in the country. And here they have a free gun. What's free these days? Nothing really <laughs> besides this podcast. And I mean, nothing. So you get on a gondola and they'll take you up to the ski lifts, up to the lower portion of the ski resort itself. And up there, they have all kinds of activities going. You can hang out, drink beer again, more beer drinking. Obviously, there's food up there. Um, there are activities for kids up there. So if you have kids with you, they can run around and play up there. Oh, they have those... Um, uh, some type of grass sleds. It, or it's actually almost oh, like really? a luge, like a dirt luge you can get on hmm. and kind of sled down this dirt luge up there on the hillside. So there's plenty to do up there. You can just walk around if you like to. So that's something we did. That we rode the gondola in Breckenridge and then hung out in Breckenridge a little bit afterwards. Another spot you can go is uh, down to Minturn or Vale. Now Vale, again, is another ski resort town, a little more adult-like. Vale's a little more sure. refined. It's right off the 70 there. But again, a beautiful town. Uh, and then Minturn is right outside of Vail, um, and it's a funky little town with some art, arts and craft stores in there, some light eating as well, but just kind of a good place to go and chill if you've kind of had it, not had it with Leadville, but if the stress is about racing is getting to you, just some two good, three good places there to get away. Yeah, they're all really close to each other. It's not like you're going to be driving all day by doing this, just worth doing that. As long as you are down in that area, not a bad idea to go and uh, get your bike and ride on the Dillon Lake uh, bike loop. It's starting from Copper Mountain. Uh, just uh, it, it, it goes around uh, Dillon Lake. It's flat. It is easy. And it is a very beautiful ride. Uh, speaking of beautiful rides, you don't have to go anywhere. You certainly don't have to drive all the way to Dillon for a beautiful bike ride. Do the mineral belt uh, uh, bike ride uh, on the on the bike path that goes around Leadville. There are a lot of cool mining carts and mining sites that you're going to see on the way. Incredibly, incredibly picturesque. Make it, you know, let it take the day. Make sure you put on lots of sunscreen because, of course, the sun is very bright. Take it easy. Take a lot of pictures. Relax. And, you know. At the same time, have some of the folks who are with you who are otherwise not going to get out on a bike during this trip uh, get a little of exercise. Yeah, I like to take, uh, I usually get Mrs. Hottie a mountain bike while we're in town. And she likes to go up the Kevin's Climb, but there, uh, there's another ride she likes to do around Turquoise Lake. Not the oh, road yeah. ride, but there's actually some great little single track around the lake itself that's not difficult. It's like, you know, it's like what would you call not even Black Diamond? It's just the easiest. Yeah, type of ski slope you could think of. That's blue with circle. this single trail. Yeah, yep. blue circle. There you go. Uh, that's what this riding is. You keep the lake in view at all times. 
Um, just some beautiful stuff. She really gets a kick out of that. So there is some uh, great off-road riding to do too, besides the course itself. Yeah, yeah. There is a zip line that is just outside of town. I've taken my kids to do that and they love it. Uh, to my surprise, I thought that I would be kind of, I don't know if I expected bored, but maybe I expected to be too cynical to enjoy that. I love that and had a ball and it is something that I want to go do again sometime. Uh, there is a, and on the complete opposite side of the spectrum, there is an opera house in Leadville, the Tabor, Tabor. How is it pronounced? I think it's Tabor. Tabor. Yeah. Well, we, we all know that I am not the right one to consult on pronunciation for this show. Uh, but the Opera House there, that is a cool place to visit as well. Uh, let's talk about some water activities. First, yeah. a fishing. Now, I, uh, I am a fly fisherman, or I've been taught to fly fish, but I've never really fished in Leadville. Now, you can, and the Alabama River is a good place to do that. But if, you're, if you don't want to fish but still want to see fish... The Fish Hatchery and Nature Walk, oh, very yeah. cool spot, Fatty. And it's right on the course, too. Oh, yeah. The, the Fish Hatchery is truly right on the course. You will go by that right after dropping down from the power line. You're going to see it one mile later. And, of course, you'll see it on the way back up, although by then you're cross-eyed and in pain. So you, <laughs> you may not see it at all. But uh, in the days before the race, go and take a look at that. Uh, you put a quarter in the little gumball type machine and get a handful of fish food and throw that to the trout that are in the troughs outside and just watch them scramble to get that. And then there's a beautiful, uh, and I'm, I truly do mean beautiful, one mile nature walk, very easy, that just takes you out into the pines and it is just gorgeous. The smell is pure pine heaven and you're going to it's a great way to kind of get away from everything make sure you put on some mosquito repellent first though mm -hmm. uh yeah if you want to see some very big trout there's some big trout <laughs> and tiny yeah. ones too yeah yeah there's some there's some big ones there now here's the hottie the big hottie tip here all from, right uh visiting leadville bring your swim trunks i say bring your swim trunks everyone uh fatty for for a long while i was really into ice baths uh, I would take an ice bath after most hard efforts for recovery purposes. Hmm. And I just found it to be super refreshing. Now, the cool thing about Leadville is you don't have to get in the tub. All you have to do is get into Turquoise Lake. <laughs> uh, that baby is chilly, but oh, I yeah. love it. So I go swimming in Leadville every time I'm there. Uh, it is the lake, Turquoise Lake, is uh, a bit sandy on the bottom. So if you go in, you just want to watch your feet a little bit because... There can be a little, uh, it's pebbly, I want to say. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's not rough and rocky, it's pebbly. So walking on the bottom can be a little rough. But take a dip. I, I swear you'll feel absolutely refreshed by that mountain water. I've also gone in the Alabama River a little bit, swimming-wise. I didn't like it as much. Bottom can be a little muddy at spot. I say hit the lake, get in Turquoise Lake, enjoy that thing, because you're not when you're going to be racing the Leadville 100. I swear to God, you're going to be coming up <laughs> off that Sugarloaf <laughs> descent. Going up that stupid climb that I hate, looking over that lake, cussing away. <laughs> Enjoy it while you can, folks. Go in the turquoise lake. You'll feel better. Put those legs in. It reduces the swelling, too. So any inflammation you might have from travel or whatever, it's a great elixir. You know, we have th we have given people enough stuff to do that they should come out two weeks before the race. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to finish off with one thing that you ought to visit, and that is the cemetery. You are going to go by the cemetery on the on the way down out at the beginning of the race you won't be passing it on the way back because you come back a different way we'll talk about that next week but on the way down you're just not you're going only going to see it for a flash but leadville has a very impressive cemetery it is a good place to go and just visit kind of have a little bit more of a quiet moment and uh, uh sort of appreciate the people who have been uh in this mining town uh, in the many years before. Leadville's been around for a while. It's got some history, and it is cool to go and look and see it. Mm -hmm. yeah, Leadville will give you a story. Cemeteries tell stories. Yeah. Just like Leadville will give you one, too, every time. Yeah, no question. Wow, there's a lot to do here. Fatty, I am amazed how much stuff I can get in my Banjo Brothers mini seat bag. I have the mini bag. Not uh -huh. the, they have a medium bag. I have the mini one. I mean, when they sent it to me, I thought, no way. No way can I get all my gravel stuff in here. My gravel two, my two tire levers, my two CO2s, a nozzle. But guess what? It all got in that bag. 
Yeah. I was totally wrong. I was like, wow, look at this. And I think I have, I could get something else in there if I really wanted to. I got it all in that little mini seat bag. Yeah, they made this so it is going to hold a tube and all the stuff that goes with it. You're going to be able to get everything you need to change a tire. Um, as you saw uh, in the same size bag, I have stuffed and you know regularly do stuff a 29er tube, two 20 gram CO2 canisters, a lever, and of course the air chuck in. So they and they've each got their own nice little space in there so that they're not rubbing against the tube. And these bags last forever. You saw the one I had on my bike at Crusher. It is probably, I I think it's about a decade old. It's at least seven, eight years old. And there's a reason I put these all on all of my bikes, both road and mountain. They just work. They hold what you need. They keep it in place. And they last, as near as I can tell, forever. I've never had one wear out. Again, that's Banjo Brothers. Tough, practical, and affordable. Minneapolis-based. They've been in business since 2003. To get 20% off your order, go to BanjoBrothers.com forward slash fatty dash favorites. Every week we bring in Trainer Roads coach Jonathan Lee for tips on what to do and what not to do when training for the Leadville Trail 100. Here's Jonathan. Jonathan, welcome back. We're looking forward to some training tips from you. Happy to be here. Thank you. I've got them. I'm ready, locked and loaded for you. You're ready to roll. We are just (laughs) under two weeks away from this race. I am freaking Mm. out. What should I be doing right now? (laughs) Yeah, you shouldn't be freaking out. You have lots of experience here, Eldon. You know what to do. The fitness is in the bank, so to speak. You've got what you've got at this point. So uh, you shouldn't be freaking out. It's okay. Uh, This is kind of where people start to talk about tapering. um, And it kind of brings up like you, you know, that point that I mentioned that the fitness is kind of, you know, already in the bank, so to speak. Jonathan, this is uh, some people also call this the the peak period uh, where, you know, fitness uh, may not be the gains may not be as, as strong as we were seeing earlier. What should we be seeing if, say, for instance, we were to test ourselves right now? Should we still be seeing gains at this point or things kind of topped off? You know, at this point, you should not be looking to, for increased performance gains in terms of like, you know, a raise in FTP or even, you know, looking at like, oh, I hope I get a new five minute power or a more, you know, a new one hour power PR, whatever it might be. At this point, you're, you, the knife is made. You're really just doing the absolute fine tuning. You're polishing at this point. You're not even sharpening the edge. You're just polishing. So it, basically, you know, you usually see that it takes a significant amount of time to see improvement uh, with consistent training for the body. You know, it can take four to six weeks pretty regularly. You might see some like uh, changes in your body in terms of how it perceives the work. It might feel easier initially once you start training, but a lot of the time it takes, you know, four to six weeks to get that on a roll. Then, you know, you'll see that you'll have to trend your fitness intelligently by loading it for a period of time, then deloading and then loading and deloading and progressing that training over time. But you'll get to a point where your body says, I've been at this long enough. I can't, you know, stretch my limits much more. And that's when you really start to focus on this, you know, this period of the last six weeks or so where you're really focusing on just specializing what you have. So in short, it's not the time to look for additional gains, but it is the time to really make sure that you're sharp. And, you know, you do that with shorter workouts that, you know, are equal to intensity perhaps that you might face on race day. So, you know, for Leadville, we're not looking at doing threshold stuff all the day, right? It's a very long effort. So you're looking at, you know, being really efficient at, you know, putting out those tempo efforts for a long time, that sort of thing. So you should be looking at some sort of increased efficiency there. But in the end, I find that a lot of this at this point now, you're really starting to focus on this tapering time on getting the mind sharp and ready and trusting in your process and feeling confident. That's what you really want to be doing at this point. Yeah. I I wanted to ask maybe a similar question, but just from the flip side of that coin, what are the things at this point you should not be doing? Mm. You shouldn't be going out to do a hundred mile mountain bike ride. (laughs) Um, You don't need to do that. Uh, You'd be surprised, like we've mentioned in previous episodes of what you can do with much less time. Uh, What you can do for three hours, you can stretch out very far. Um, It's uh, pretty surprising. Mm. So you shouldn't be out there trying to replicate those sort of demands from race day. 
Um, uh, you know, you shouldn't be doing anything that I would say puts you in a distracted state in terms of your focus. This isn't the time to be out and, you know, you can sure do s- short races if you want coming up to this. But in my mind, what I would be doing is I would not be doing a lot of short races right now. I wouldn't be doing road races. I wouldn't be doing that sort of thing. Instead, I would just be focusing on the task at hand. So I, I think a, a lot has to be said for focus and how important that is coming into an event, especially a race like Leadville. When races get longer like this, they just, there's so much more time for your mind to be the governor for your body, right? And your body will want to give up at many points. So if you can really sharpen that mind, man, it makes a huge difference. And if you're the type of person that really loves to race and has a hard time kicking races off the calendar when they pop up, I think that it's a good idea to, you know, not be doing to a whole lot of racing. If this is your a event and you're really focused on this thing, just really, you know, focus in. And it's also, it's not the time to be making gigantic changes with your equipment or nutrition mm-hmm. that should have already been done. Uh, yeah. hopefully you're not, you know, burning the midnight oil to make sure that you're changing something around like that. Yeah. We've beat that drum pretty consistently. One thing that I <laughs> often wonder as a guy who, you know, I, you know, with the guy with a name like fatty, you know that I'm always fighting my weight, right? Less than two weeks in, I look at my, you know, I step on the scale, notice that I'm still three or four pounds heavier than I wish I was for this race day. Would it do me any good to, you know, restrict my calories a little bit or do other things to lose weight? Or is it too late and I'm just going to hurt my performance by trying to lose a little bit of weight quickly? You know, I, I'm, I'm going to approach it from a different angle and I hope that it, I hope that it answers this. Uh, it, there's a very complicated relationship that we have as cyclists with food, right? Mm. Um, and it's, and it can even become unhealthy and it's easy, especially coming into a race for a lot of racers to look at that scale, not see that number. And then as a result, they starve themselves, uh, to get down to the weight that they need. And then they, you know, they go into that race and, and in almost every situation that doesn't end up going very well. The reason for that is <clears throat> when you put food into your body, hopefully it's high quality food. That's fuel for your body. And the way that I look at food is I look at food as fuel to fuel workouts or fuel different endeavors in my life. Right. Um, you know, that, that kind of takes away the indulgent aspect of food a bit, maybe makes it a bit easier for me to say no to that extra brownie. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but the thing that it does above all is it teaches me that if I'm coming into this race, I can't deprive myself of quality nutrients and expect my body to avoid that sickness that I'm going to, you know, when I, when I, I'm on that plane and everyone's coughing around me. Um, I can't expect my body, you know, to deprive my body of resources and fight that off. I can't expect my body to deprive, be deprived of resources and then, you know, balance all of my hormones and everything else that I need to actually get the most out of sleep so that I can come into this race and actually be rested properly. Uh, and then on top of that, your body, if you, you know, deprive it or take some big shift in diet that throws your body, you know, all the chemical systems of your body for a bit of a loop as well. So you'll basically, you know, you know, we talk about don't change anything before race day. In essence, what you're doing is you're chemically altering your body. So it's really not the time to, to panic about losing weight. You're not going to make a lot of lasting change. And in many cases, you'll find yourself, you know, dehydrating yourself unintentionally even to, to drop that weight because you're just chasing the number and that's not what you want to do. So don't worry about it. And in the end, you'll find that over, geez, I think it's over. I think we've mentioned this perhaps before on this podcast, but when you look at the time that you'll lose of carrying, you know, an extra three pounds, something like that, it's actually not that huge. Now I understand if you're fighting for eight hours and you got really close before, like you have before Eldon, then you want to, you know, get close again. That's, that's tricky, but you know, and, and weight really does matter there, but it's really not as much as you think. We put a little bit too much stock in weight. So prioritize health over weight. Thanks so much. Really great training tips as always, Jonathan. Thanks, Elvin. How do you know that weight is kind of an ongoing battle for me, <laughs> obviously with a name like fatty. And I worry about it, especially for climbing intensive races like this. One of the points Jonathan made reminded me back in 2015, I got up on a stage in Leadville at the Tabor Opera House, and you know that's definitely a spot worth checking out again. As part of a pre-race book reading and interview Rebecca Rush and I were doing together, I'm not sure how the conversation turned to it, but Reba asked if there was anything I was worried about for this race, and I said, yeah, I didn't really lose all the weight that I needed to. 
And she made a point pretty similar to what Jonathan made here. Your weight isn't really the biggest determining factor in how your race goes. And that fact, uh, the fact is I finished that race faster than I ever had before. I finished it in eight hours and 12 minutes. So, I mean, the point being, guys, as you are getting ready for this race, if you're a couple pounds heavy, don't let that be something you obsess over. You're mm -hmm. still in a good position, you know, strength matters and mm -hmm. maybe more than a couple extra pounds. Yeah, my lowest weight at Leadville did not equal my fastest time. It was when I added a little muscle mass, mm -hmm. became a stronger, albeit heavier rider, that I also became faster at the Leadville Trail 100. Patty, as we put the wraps on this one, we'd like to remind everyone that this podcast can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Music, and the home website, Leadville100podcast.com. Subscribing, rating, and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts helps others who have caught the endurance cycling bug find us. Yeah, and if you have any questions or ideas for us, head over to the website's comment section, get in touch. Also, follow me on Twitter. I am at Fat Cyclist and follow us both on Facebook where we are active in the Leadville 100 MTB Participants, uh, participants Group. They need an easier name to say. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> so one last little Easter egg here. By very popular demand, seriously, the single most comment, the single most popular comment we've gotten on this podcast, we're going to put up a bonus episode this Friday containing all of the course segments back to back. It's going to be very long, more than two hours, but Oof. it is going to be a fun way to review the whole race. Maybe something to listen to as you make the flight or drive to Colorado. So watch for that. Uh, good luck in your training. Thanks for listening as always, and we'll see you at the finish line. See you on the course, everyone. Mm -hmm.